management your way management is chapter six and it's one of the most important chapters in the emr textbook it's one of the most important chapters to the fundamentals of managing a patient that is critical Introduction. Two most important life saving skills that you can learn as a EMR is going to be assessing and managing the airway, that's upper airway, and rescue breathing, which is managing ventilations. The ABCs consist of airway, breathing, circulation things that can kill a patient very quickly in the field. One, a patient with an airway that's closed. Two, a patient with ventilation issues or a patient in which the chest is not moving and a patient who is bleeding excessively. These are things that you should keep in the back of your mind when assessing a patient that is critical. Now let's review the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. To maintain life, all humans must have food, water, and oxygen. Lack of oxygen, even for, for minutes, can result in irreversible damage and death. The main purpose of the respiratory system is to provide oxygen and remove carbon dioxide from the red blood cells. We spoke about this earlier. The respiratory system is divided into the upper airway structures and the lower airway structures. In an unconscious patient lying on his or her back, the passage of ear through both nose and mouth may be blocked by the tongue. So when a patient is not responding or the patient is unresponsive, the muscles that control the tongue relax and the tongue will fall back into the ear passage. When the tongue falls back into the ear passage, it can either block the airway completely or it can block, block the airway partially. If the airway is completely blocked, there will be no sound. If it is partially blocked, you will hear snoring. Other parts of the respiratory system to be familiar with at the back of the throat are two passages, the esophagus, which is posterior, and the trachea, which is anterior. The epiglottis helps prevent food or water from entering the airway. The airway divides into the bronchi. I have a right and left bronchi. The lungs are located on either side of the heart. The smaller airways that branch from the bronchi will break down into bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchioles, there are tiny ear sacs called alveoli, which is where the gas exchange will occur. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs at the level of the alveoli or and this is referred to as alveolar ventilation this diagram shows the pulmonary capillaries wrapped around the alveoli the red vessels represent oxygen oxygenated blood the blue ones represent 
deoxygenated blood. The lungs consist of soft, spongy tissue with no muscles. Movement of air into the lungs depend on the movement of the rib cage and the diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts during inhalation, which is an active process, this causes the diaphragm to move downward. So that this increases the, the size of the thoracic cavity. On exhalation, the diaphragm relax, and when the diaphragm relax, it moves upward. This decreases the size. So inhalation increases the size of the, the thoracic cavity. Exhalation decreases the size of the thoracic cavity. In other words, we breathe in with negative pressure, we breathe out with positive pressure. Very important concept to understand. So when the diaphragm contracts and move downwards, the size of the thoracic cavity increases and this creates a negative pressure. So we're able to pull air into the lungs. When the diaphragm relax, relaxes during exhalation, it moves upward, which decreases the size of the thoracic cavity, which causes um, an increase in the pressure inside of the, the lungs, and that causes air to be pushed out of the lungs. Breathe in with negative pressure, breathe out with positive pressure. When we breathe in, it's active. When we breathe out, it's passive. Now, A is for airway. In healthy individuals, the airway automatically stays open. When a patient is injured or seriously ill, they might not be able to protect their airway or it may become blocked. It is your responsibility as an EMR to ensure that you assess the patient's airway and if it is compromised, you do what is necessary to position it and keep it clear. So check for responsiveness. Ask the patient, are you okay? So if you have a patient that is found and not responding, you need to find out the name of the patient if possible. Might not be possible in all cases. If you cannot, then you need to find out if the patient is responsive. Introduce yourself. My name is Ryan Rufus. I'm an EMR. I'm here to help. Sir, can you hear me? Right. So find out if the patient is responsive. If you get a response, assume that the patient is conscious and has an open airway. So if the patient is talking to you, their upper airway is patent. If there is no response, gently shake the patient's shoulder and repeat the question. Sir, can you hear me? So if you don't get any response, then obviously the airway is compromised at this point or may be compromised. So if the patient is unresponsive, call 911 before doing anything. So if you recognize that the patient is unresponsive, make sure that you activate EMS response as soon as possible before you start to do anything on that patient. Then position the patient by supporting the head and neck and placing the patient on his or her back. Quickly scan the patient's chest for breathing and simultaneously check for a pulse. If the patient has a pulse but is not breathing, you need to correct the airway. So you find a patient in a particular location, introduce yourself to the patient. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. My name is Ryan Rufus. 
I'm a EMR. I'm here to help. Can you hear me? No response. Mom, sir, can you hear me? Still no response. Get someone or you call for EMS. You need to activate EMS response. Once you have activated EMS response, make sure you position the patient on your back. Observe for signs of breathing. And at the same time, simultaneously, check for a pulse. If you cannot see any chest rise and there is a pulse, you need to check the rate of that pulse, the consistency of that pulse, and the strength. The patient is not breathing, then it is your responsibility to breathe for that patient. No, to correct a blocked airway. You have the head tilt chin lift maneuver, and you have what is referred to as a jaw thrust maneuver. The head tilt chin lift is indicated when the patient is unresponsive and there is no signs of spinal injury or no indication i should say that there is a spinal injury if a spinal injury is suspected then a jaw truss technique would be used so the head tilt chin lift maneuver place the patient on his or her back place one hand on the patient's forehead apply firm pressure backward place the tips of your fingers under the bony part of the lower jaw, lift the chin forward and tilt the head back. And this is done when there is no spinal injury suspected. If a spinal injury is suspected, which will be based on the mechanism of injury, which we will discuss further when we cover patient assessment, if there is a suspected spinal injury, then we need to open the airway in a way in which the neck is not manipulated. And that technique is the jaw thrust, jaw thrust maneuver. So use if, suspect, if you suspect a neck injury, place the patient on his or her back, place your fingers behind the lower jaw and move the jaw forward so in so basically the jaw choice maneuver is manipulating the the um the joint of the mandible tilt the head back to a neutral or sniffing position use your thumbs to pull down the lower jaw and open the mouth enough to allow breathing these are skills that you will practice in the skill sessions now once we have positioned a patient's airway the next phase of your assessment is to ensure that the airway is clear so you check the patient's level of responsiveness. And let me just make this clear before I even go any further. Make sure before you interact with any patient, you have on your um, PPE, at minimum gloves. And if you're going to be manipulating a patient's earway, I would recommend that you, your eyes, nose and mouth are covered. So you take the appropriate standard precautions, you assess the patient, introduce yourself, find out if the patient is responsive. Patient not responsive, activate EMS response. Then position the patient's airway or position the patient on their back, look for signs of breathing, simultaneously check for a pulse. Once you can feel a pulse and there is no chest rise, you 
you need to check the rate, how fast that pulse is, is it consistent and is it weak? And if the patient is not breathing, you will have to breathe for the patient. Now, once you position the airway, you need to check to see if it's clear. So you're looking for secretions like vomitus, mucus, or blood. If you can see secretions, you may have to turn that patient on their side or turn the patient's head to the side and use your glove finger to clear the secretions from the patient's mouth. Or if you have a suction available and you know to use it, then you would suction to clear the ear passage. If there is a foreign object, such as candy, food, or dirt, again, if you can reach that object with your fingers, you're going to turn the patient on their side or turn the head to the side and use your fingers to remove the object. Dentures or false teeth, the same principle. If it's compromising the airway, turn the patient on their side as a unit. If you suspect spinal injury, if not, turn the head to the side. And if you can physically reach the object, reach it with your fingers, glove fingers, and remove it. So if you find anything in the patient's mouth, remove it. If the mouth is clear, consider using an airway device. So position the airway, check if it's clear. If it's clear, then you need to use a device to maintain the airway. So finger sweeps can be done quickly and require no special equipment except a set of medical gloves. You might not have a suction readily available and sometimes based on the, the, the um, foreign object that is in the mouth, you can't suction it. You have to physically remove it. If there is fluid, you may have to finger sweep until a suction is available. If a suction is available, then you would use the suction. And I'll teach you how to use a suction. I have different types of suction device, devices. As an EMR, you should have a manual suction device in your jump bag. And if you're going to be functioning as an EMR, you need a jump bag. Within that jump bag, you should have everything that you would need in the first five minutes to stabilize a patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. So you shouldn't be responding without appropriate equipment. But as I said, manual suction might, a suction might not be available. You have to do what you can do with your, your glove finger. So you have manual suction devices. It is relatively inexpensive. It is compact enough to fit into EMR life support kits. Insert end of the suction tip into the patient's mouth and squeeze or pump the hand poured pump. So it's easy to use. Um, you might not get the best results in comparison to a ba um, battery operated suction device, but you do what you can to the best of your abilities. No, suctioning. Mechanical suction devices. Clear the patient's mouth with your glove finger. So this is if you actually have a suction um, device available. Turn on the suction. So you have manual suction devices or hand-operated suction devices. You have fixed-mounted suction devices and the fixed one is on the unit, I have your battery operated. You have one that is battery operated or it's a fixed suction device, then you need to be familiar with how the device is used. Now, if it's a patient that has a lot of secretions in the ear passage, we would use what is referred to as a rigid suction catheter. If there is minimal secretions 
or there's fluid coming out of the nose, or there's limited space to maneuver inside of the patient's mouth, then we would use what is referred to as a flexible suction catheter or a French tip suction catheter. Once you're going to use a suction device, mechanical suction device, do not suction the patient's ear passage for more than 15 seconds. So the standard is 15 seconds for an adult, 10 seconds for a child, five, second, five seconds for an infant. And if they have an advanced earway in place, you don't exceed 10 seconds. Change to flexible tip and clear out deeper parts of the patient's throat. So the flexible suction catheter is preferred to go deeper into the patient's um, ear passage. Never suction beyond what you can see. And you always suction or create suction coming out of the patient's ear passage. Never create suction going in. And this is your portable mechanical suction device. Very good device to have on your, your unit. It's a lifesaver. It is definitely a lifesaver. Um, I strongly prefer the portable mechanical suction device over the handheld, but whatever is available to you, you use. And if you don't have any suction, go and clear that earway with your glove finger. And you can use the, um, the earway device as a bite block, which I will show you how to do that when we meet for skills. Now, maintaining the earway. For unconscious patients, continue holding the head to maintain the head till chin lift or jaw thrust position. Very important. So if a patient is unresponsive and you open the, their earway, you can't let it go. It has to be maintained. The only way you can release that earway is if there is a device keeping the tongue or keeping the earway patent. If the patient is breathing adequately, place him or her in the recovery position. So, very important point to note. If you have a patient that is semi-responsive or unresponsive or unconscious, the same thing, or semi-conscious, and the patient has visible chest rise, meaning you can see good chest rise bilaterally, you will turn that patient on their side. So you, that's referred to as the recovery position. Now the recovery position can only be used for patients who have no suspected spinal injury. So it's very important for you to know when to use your recovery position. Very important. So you have somebody pass out in front of you in a chair or faint in a chair. That is a candidate that you would put in the recovery position once they are unresponsive or semi-conscious, but their chest rise is good. Very important point to note. So that's when you would use a recovery position. So the recovery position, if an unconscious patient is breathing, and has not suffered trauma, place the patient in the recovery position. This position will help keep the patient's airway open and allow secretions to drain out of the mouth. It uses gravity to help keep the patient's tongue and lower jaw from blocking the ear passage or airway. And I'll I'll teach you how to do that when we come for, for skills. So to place a patient in the recovery position, roll the patient onto one side as you support the patient's head. 
face the patient's face on his or her side, so any secretions drain out of the mouth. We will cover it in skills, no worries. Now, airway adjuncts. You have what is referred to as the oral airway, and the oral airway goes into the patient's mouth. It has two primary purposes. One, to maintain the patient's airway, and it can also create a pathway for suctioning. Now, the indication for an oral airway is, one, the patient must be unresponsive. So it must be a patient that is unresponsive. The gag reflex must be absent, and a gag reflex is a vomiting reflex. So the gag reflex must be up, um, absent and the patient must have a ventilation problem. So I'll repeat that again. The indication for an oral airway is one, the patient must be unresponsive. That's one. Two, the gag reflex must be absent. When a patient is unresponsive with a ventilation issue, the gag reflex is usually absent at that point. So the gag reflex or vomiting reflex must be absent. And the patient must have a ventilation issue. Now, what would be indicative of a ventilation issue. One, any patient who, any patient that you find breathing slow with a change in level of consciousness has a ventilation issue. So if a patient is breathing slow, that's a ventilation problem. If a patient is breathing irregular, they will have a ventilation problem. If a patient is breathing where the chest is barely moving or breathing shallow, they will also have a ventilation problem. So any patient that's breathing slow, any patient that's breathing irregular, any patient in which you can barely see the chest move and their level of consciousness has been compromised will will, is a patient that requires um, ventilation management they have ventilation problems. Now, please note that I gave three indicators, three indicators. Now, one of the most important principles of medicine when it comes to treating patients, you cannot treat something that you have not assessed. So you cannot manage what you have not assessed. Therefore, if you are going to take up an earway adjunct, specifically the oral earway to use in your patient's ear passage, you must have assessed for your three indicators. So if you have not assessed for the three indicators, you should not be using the earway. You cannot manage what you have not assessed. That's how we kill patients in the field. So again, for the oral airway, the patient must be unresponsive, the gag reflex must be absent, and the patient must have a ventilation problem, meaning you can barely see chest rise. That's the indication. So it's either you barely see the chest rise or there is no chest rise. And that's what the oral earway looks like. Now, it can be used with mechanical breathing devices, which you will practice with. Um, for EMRs, it's recommended that you use a pocket mask. So that's something that you will need in your practice or function as an EMR. 
Um, if you don't have your pocket mask when you come for the skill sessions, we'll work with the BVM. But the desired device is a pocket mask. And the reason for that is, remember that the EMR is going to be the first medically trained person to interact with the patient. So it might be just you alone initially. And if it's you alone initially, it is better to use a pocket mask to breathe for a patient than to use a BVM. And you'll understand why when we, we cover the skills. But a, a pocket mask is prefer, preferred and that's a good investment. So the earway adjuncts are tied to breathing devices, whether it's a pocket mask or a bag valve mask or BVM. To properly place the oral earway, it has to be measured. So it has to be measured. So to select the proper size earway, we measure from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe, or it can be the angle of the jaw, from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw, and then we insert the device. Not gonna go into too much details of the technique, I'll probably show you a video tomorrow and you'll get your hands on practice with that. So don't worry too much about that. Now, the other earway adjunct that you should be familiar with as an EMR and should know how to, to insert is a nasal earway. So the oral earway goes into the mouth, the nasal earway goes into the nose. It can be used in a patient who is unconscious or it can be used in a patient that is semi-conscious. Right? Semi-conscious, not conscious. We won't use it on a patient that's conscious. So it's either unconscious or semi-conscious. Now the indications for the nasal earway. It's three indications just like the oral earway. One, patient must be either unresponsive or semi-responsive with a gag reflex present. So the patient must be unresponsive or semi-responsive, but a gag reflex is present and they are still having a ventilation issue, meaning you can barely see the chest rise. What do we look for to determine that? Is the patient breathing slow? Is the patient breathing irregular? Is there poor chest rise bilaterally? Is the patient semi-conscious? Then we definitely need to use an NPA or nasal airway. So it is used both in unconscious and semi-conscious patients to maintain an open airway. Not as likely to cause vomiting. You cannot suction through a nasal earway. So if secretions start to come up through the nose, you may have to remove it and then clear the secretions. Now, to insert the device, it has to be measured just like the oral earway. And we're measuring from the tip of the nose to the earlobe or angle of the jaw in what we would consider to be the position of function. Before it is inserted, it must be lubricated and we will attempt to insert it in the right nostril first because in most persons, the right nostril is bigger. Now, contraindication to when you would, and that means when you would not use the device. Any patient with suspected trauma that you find unresponsive, sorry, semi-responsive with a gag reflex, you do not use an NPA, it's contraindicated. If you suspect that the patient has a head and spine injury or a skull fracture, no NPA. So in generally it's not used for trauma patients. That's a standard. Now, 
No. So we have looked at how we manage the upper airway. So let's do a quick recap. So when it comes to managing the upper airway, it requires us to position, check to see that the airway is clear, and we're gonna look, listen, and feel while simultaneously checking for a pulse. That's the assessment. Check, so we position, check if the airway is clear, look, listen, feel, simultaneously check for a pulse. That's an upper airway assessment. So you have a patient that is not communicating. You arrive on location, introduce yourself. Hello, sir, hello, ma'am. My name is so-and-so, I'm an EMR, I'm here to assist. Can you hear me? No response. Ma'am, sir, can you hear me? Still no response. Call for EMS, activate your EMS response system or call for the ambulance with EMTs or higher. Once you have done that, the next step is to position the airway. And the technique that you use at that point will be dependent on whether you suspect spinal injury or no spinal injury. If you suspect no spinal injury, it's a head, head tilt chin lift maneuver. If you suspect spinal injury, you're going to be doing a jaw truss technique. Now keep in mind, it's very difficult to maintain a jaw truss and manage a patient's airway by yourself. So you got, might need some assistance with that one. Once you have positioned the airway, check to see if it's clear. If it's not clear, do what you need to, to do to clear it. And that can be turning the head to the side, turning the patient to the side, using your glove finger to clear anything that's coming out of the mouth. And if there is secretions and you have suction available in your EMR kit, you can suction the ear passage. And that would be a handheld, handheld suction, more than likely. Now, once you have ensured that the earway is clear, you look, listen, and feel. So you're looking at the chest rise, right? Looking for chest rise, you're listening for breath sounds, you're feeling for ear and you're simultaneously checking that pulse. If a pulse is present and there's no chest rise, then you need to check that pulse. How fast, how consistent, how weak or strong is that pulse? If there is no chest rise and a pulse is present, you have to manage that patient's airway. And to manage that patient's airway effectively, you will need to utilize airway adjuncts. So you are going to be using your oral airway or your nasal airway, and it depends on the patient's presentation. For the oral airway, the patient must be unresponsive, a gag reflex must be absent, and there must be a ventilation problem. And what you're looking for to determine if a ventilation problem is present is, is the patient breathing slow? Is the patient breathing irregular? And by irregular breathing, I mean, is it speeding up, slowing down? Is there a pause? So you're looking for inconsistencies in the breathing pattern. Is there visible chest rise bilaterally? So if you see poor chest rise, then you need to breathe for the patient. And that would be your indication for your oral airway. For your nasal airway, the patient can be unresponsive. Most times they are semi-responsive, but they can be unresponsive. A gag reflex is present and the patient still has a ventilation problem. So that's the indication, that's the assessment and management of the upper airway. Now, when we look at the lower airway, we need to be able to determine if a patient is breathing adequately. 
So you can use the look, listen, and feel technique to assess adequacy of breathing. Look for rise and follow the patient's chest. Listen for sounds of ear passing into and out of the patient's nose or mouth and feel the ear moving on the side of your face. So once a patient is showing signs of breathing, once you can see signs of breathing, you must assess the breathing. So if a patient is showing signs of breathing, how fast is the patient's breathing? Count it for a minute. The rise and fall for one minute, and that will give you the breathing rate per minute. Is it consistent? Is it regular or irregular? Do you see any signs of muscle use? So look to see if the patient is showing muscle use. Can you hear anything abnormal when the patient is breathing? And can you see chest rise? bilaterally. Are you able to see chest rise? These are things that we look for in breathing. Now, as an EMR, I don't expect you to, to cover all of those um, assessments, but two things I would expect from, well, three, three things I would expect from you as an EMR. One, check the rate of the patient's breathing. Check the rate of the patient's breathing. Two, check the consistency of the patient's breathing. So is there consistency? Do you see a regular pattern of chest rise? And can you see visible chest rise bilaterally? So these are essential things to pay attention to as an EMR. You might not be familiar with abnormal sounds and you might not be too familiar with muscle use, but if you've ever seen a person having an asthma attack, you'll know what muscle use is or what muscle use looks like. And the point is this, you're not supposed to be able to see muscle use when a patient is breathing. So if you can see muscle use, something is wrong. So you have to know what is normal for you to be able to identify what would be considered abnormal. So if you don't know the signs of adequate breathing, you won't be able to identify inadequate breathing because inadequate breathing is the opposite of normal. So you're looking for or listening for noisy respiration, wheezing or gurgling, rapid or gasping respirations, pale or blue skin, right? And wheezing is, is associated with lower airway issues. Gurgling is associated with upper airway problems. The most critical sign is respiratory arrest. And it's very easy to identify respiratory arrest. The word arrest means stop. That's what arrest means, to stop. So respiratory arrest is a patient who has stopped breathing. That's easy to identify. You see that your patient is in trouble. Your patient is in serious trouble. That's something that can kill a patient and kill a patient very quickly. So if a patient cannot ventilate, they are in serious trouble. So the most critical sign is respiratory arrest, which is characterized by a lack of chest movement, a lack of breath sounds, a lack of ear against the side of your face. Easy to identify. Now, things that can cause respiratory arrest, heart attacks. It can be caused by a mechanical blockage or obstruction, right? So the tongue, and the most common thing to obstruct the airway is the tongue in unresponsive patient. And that can kill a patient. If the tongue is not removed, especially if it's completely blocking the airway, it can kill the patient. It can, respiratory arrest can be caused by vomitus, particularly in a patient weakened by a condition such as stroke. So the patient, has received a stroke and 
their tongue is not working properly or one side of the body is not working properly, their airway can be significantly compromised if they start to vomit. That can kill them. Respiratory arrest can be caused by foreign objects. And of course, it can be caused by illness or disease. Can be caused from drug overdose, can be caused from poisoning, can be caused from severe blood loss, can occur if a patient is electrocuted or they suffer a lightning strike. No, check for the presence of breathing. So assessment of a motionless patient begins by checking for responsiveness and the signs of breathing. And again, before you make contact with any patient, ensure that you take the standard precautions. So put on your PPE, at minimum, your gloves. And if you're going to be manipulating a, a patient's ear passage, put on your mask, put on your goggles, which should be a part of your EMR kit. If a patient is unresponsive or unconscious, quickly scan the chest to see if the patient is breathing. And before you do any type of assessment on the patient, where earway management is concerned, ensure that you activate EMS response or call for the ambulance. Correct breathing. Now, as you perform rescue breathing, keep the patient's airway patent. And rescue breathing is required when a patient is in respiratory arrest. What does that mean? It means that the patient is not breathing, but a pulse is present. When a patient is not breathing and a pulse is present, we have to provide rescue breathing for that patient. In other words, we have to create the ventilation, ventilations for the patient. We don't do mouth to mouth anymore. So that's not something we're gonna practice in our classroom setting. Certainly, if you want to do it for your family member, feel free, but it's not something we will be practicing in the face-to-face -face session. You're either gonna use your pocket mask or you're going to be using a BVM. And once a patient has a pulse, it is one breath every five to six seconds for an adult, closer to the six seconds for adults. That's a new change. And for the pediatric population, it is one breath every three to five seconds. I want to be um, closer to the three seconds for the pediatric population. Okay. Now, this is the, the device that you would use to do your rescue breathing. This is the preferred device for EMRs, pocket masks. So don't have one, you need to invest in one or your organization need to assist you in getting one. But it's a, it's a very important equipment. It is an equipment that you're required to be tested on, but we'll see how that works out. So mouth to mass rescue breathing. It enables you to perform rescue breathing without mouth to mouth contact. It reduce, reduces the risk of transmitting infectious diseases. To use a mouth to mass ventilation device, follow the following steps. Don't worry about the skill portion. We will cover that in our classroom setting. Now, mouth to barrier rescue breathing. And these are um, like face shields or, yeah. Devices are small enough to carry in your pocket and consist of a port or hole you breathe into and a mask or plastic film that covers the patient's face. Provide variable degrees of infection control. Not gonna focus too much on that one. Um, as I said, it's, it's, 
it would be ideal to invest in a pocket mass. That's a gold standard. Right? Don't practice mode to mode anymore. Now the bug mass device or BVM, this is another option for you as a um, EMR. Uh, preferred technique is two person. But if you have a very good seal, one person can use a BVM or a bug mass device or bug valve mask as it is sometimes referred. So place the mask over the face of the patient and make a tight seal, squeezing the bag pushes ear through one through a one-way valve through the mask and into the patient's mouth and nose, and eventually down into the lungs. As the patient exhales, a second one-way valve releases the ear. So there's a valve that will release the ear when the patient um, chest recoils. Don't worry, we will be practicing with that. And as I stated previously, the preferred technique is two person. So the ideal method, especially for EMRs, is going to be two person technique, not one person. But I will see what you're capable of when we meet face to face. So I will teach you the one person technique. If you're struggling too much with that, we'll focus more on the two person. But you want to get that pocket mask. Invest in that pocket mask. Now, let's review airway and breathing. So this is our review. So one, take your standard precautions. Check for responsiveness by shouting, are you OK? You don't literally have to ask, are you OK? You can say, sir, are you hearing me? Can you hear me? That would be fine. And shaking the patient's shoulder. If the patient is unresponsive, activate EMS response. Do not delay activating EMS response or calling for an ambulance. Place the patient on his or her back. Quickly scan the patient for signs of breathing and check for a pulse simultaneously. If a pulse is present, you want to know if it's fast or slow, is it consistent, is it weak? If the patient is not breathing, then you're gonna need to maintain the airway, upper airway, and breathe for the patient. And the techniques to position the airway is your head tilt chin lift or your jaw thrust maneuver. The head tilt chin lift is for your medical patient the jaw thrust maneuver is for your patient that you suspect have spinal injury. Check the mouth for any secretions, vomiting, or solid objects. If anything is found, clear the mouth. Correct a blocked airway with finger sweeps or suctioning. It depends on what is available to you at that particular time. Maintain the airway by holding it open or by using an oral or nasal airway. And do not use these devices unless you have assessed for the indicators. It must be indicated. You cannot assess what, sorry, you cannot manage what you have not assessed. Very important. Now for breathing, check for the presence of breathing while determining responsiveness. Correct the lack of breathing by performing rescue breathing using a mouth to mask or mouth to barrier device if available. Mouth to mask is preferred. Rescue breathing for children and infants. So for your adults, it is one breath every five to six seconds, and you're gonna be going closer to the six seconds. For children or infants, it's one breath every three to five seconds. The younger the pediatric patient is, the closer you will go to that three seconds. Now, 
any infant an infant is tiny and must be treated extremely gentle gently and we'll go through the variations so there are some things that you need to keep in mind in terms of how you position an infant or a very young child to breed for them now i'm going to talk about it i'll demonstrate that in the practicals now causes of airway obstruction the most common airway obstruction is the tongue if the tongue is blocking the airway head till chin lift maneuver or jaw trust maneuver should open the airway food is the most common foreign object that causes an airway obstruction if a foreign body is lodged in the ear passage you must use other techniques to remove it now we're not going to go through the choking right now so what we're going to do is pause here so we will stop here for airway